Well, hello everyone. I'm excited to be here today. Glad to see you all here. I'm the uh, chief architect of H2O. That's a company that makes a machine learning platform. And I have a PhD in physics, so I'm a supercomputing guy that turned data scientist, if you want, or algorithm implementer in the last four or five years. And you can read more about me in this uh, Fortune magazine. It shows how I came from a little village in Europe to a Silicon Valley. And now I'm here talking about artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning. Um, these are all concepts that are related to each other. And deep learning is one of those hot topics nowadays um, that, that try to implement particular methods to get closer to artificial intelligence. And I'll give you a, qu a quick overview of the, the history of artificial intelligence and then what you can do about it. I'll show a live demo, um, our product. It's all open source, so you can actually play with that in, in your hands later today. So deep learning, quickly, for those that don't know, it's, it's basically a bunch of numbers, and the model represents some kind of um, uh, representation of the data, right? So incoming data like heartbeat and oxygen levels and blood pressure, for example, gets turned into uh, new numbers at every layer. And at the end, out comes two numbers. One says uh, how likely it is that you should be sent to the ICU, and the other one says how likely you should be sent to a regular doctor, for example. And if that model is a good model, then those numbers are good numbers. And if it's a bad number uh, everywhere, then maybe the model isn't as good, right? You get a random model. So the goal is to learn these connections, those weights, uh, such that the model is good. And that's a very complicated uh, nonlinear non-convex optimization problem, but it turns out that brute force is actually pretty good at this. And with GPUs and, and clusters, you can do a good job at this. And especially with images and audio and speech and so on, you can do a lot of cool stuff with it. This is all old technology, just rebranded now as deep learning. And um, with modern hardware, you can do a lot. So 60 years ago, the term artificial intelligence was coined by John McCarthy. He said, let's do a little summer project, a few people, a couple months. We should do significant um, improvements towards this goal. Turned out it took a lot longer, and we're still not there. But we got certainly somewhere. So almost two decades ago, Kasparov was beaten by IBM, right? Deep Blue. Many of you remember this. That was done with, um, at the top you see good algorithms and some faster computers. So finally, the computers were fast enough to actually beat humans at brute force calculations. And you can say, well, it's obvious, right? With enough brain power, so to speak, you can predict all these possible paths and then figure out which one to take. It, that's not artificial intelligence. That's just doing everything and then picking the best. And that's true. That's what that was. Then a few years later, first self-driving cars came out that were actually good enough to drive for hundreds of miles totally autonomously, and it was proven that you don't need humans to drive a car. So even that's not that hard. You could say, well, all you need is a couple of cameras, some, some feedback systems to turn these analog images into some signals that say, is there a tree in the way or not? And then you can do an if-else condition. If there's a tree, then turn the wheel. You know, all this stuff kind of makes sense now. But if you had asked 50 years ago, can a machine self-drive itself through the city? You would say, well, no, of course not. So it's always a little bit, every step takes us a little closer to artificial intelligence. Then this, this random question stuff with Jeopardy, right? You ask anything and the machine has to answer it. Well, how did they do it? They took a Hadoop cluster, 90 servers, put in all the lexicographic information, all the <coughs> encyclopedia, uh, Wikipedia, all that stuff, dumped it onto those um, disks then sucked it into some in-memory system, some index, let's say, where they can do quick lookups with human rules. So they had six million logic rules encoded that say, if it's this and this, then do this and this. And those rules were somehow hard-coded for the system. And then when you ask a question like, who won this and this game back in 1974, all it has to do is find the best match. And once it's certain enough that it found something reasonable, it'll just press the button and say, I got it. And that only takes a millisecond, so it beats every human, and you're done. Basically, that's what happened there. 
even though the humans were really smart, right? If you watch this video, you'll be surprised how good they were, but they were not as fast as the machine at pressing the button. Then Google came along, or actually the company they acquired, and said, we can turn anything that's written into different language. And now you could say that is artificial intelligence because who else could understand all 100 languages or something that uh, are listed in this Google Translate app? Well, it's just work if you want, right? It's just, it's just best matching of some training data. Humans give feedback, then it fixes it, and it gets smarter and smarter. So even this, you can now understand and say, oh, it makes sense. They might need convolutional and recurrent neural nets. These are technologies that are very advanced that can like, detect from an image that there's text inside. And then once they see that there's text inside, they can make uh, semantic meaning out of that text and say, OK, this text means actually this and this. So let's translate that in the same meaning to a different language without just turning each word or each character to a different um, character. So it, it can make some more sense of it. And this is pretty cool, especially when you talk to some friend in a different country live on the phone and it translates your voice to the different language. Um, that's all doable nowadays with um, deep learning. So almost artificial intelligence but it's still not going to buy itself a glass um, of red wine at the restaurant, right? It's not deciding to do something new. It just does what it was told to do. And here, this is um, computer games, right? Atari games. By the way, it's still not possible to play Pac-Man um, because it's too difficult to have all these ghosts and all this stuff. Not every game can be easily learned, but simple games like that, one where you just move a cursor left to right, you get a reward that says you, you did well or you didn't do well, and, and you just memorize what worked, what didn't work, and you move the cursor in that direction that, according to your history, was better. And now you can move the cursor faster than, or better, more precise than any human, and you beat everybody else. You're the best Atari gamer in the world. And it can be done from raw pixels, so that the, the deep learning model looks at the pixels and then says, OK, now I know where the red bar is or the blue bar or whatever, and that means such and such. It's all just memorizing from the past. Then this AlphaGo Google program um, beat the smartest Go player in the world. This is a 19 square board that has lots of little stones on it that are either black or, uh, or white. And there's not as many stones as there's uh, fields, but it's still a lot of combinations, right? You can imagine just swapping any two of them gives you another combination. So there's two um, times 10 to the 170 different combinations, which is the square number of the number of atoms in the universe, right? So it's a huge number of combinations. And um, you would never imagine that a machine can guess what to do better than a human, or would you? Well, people thought, no way. But in a way, the human is also not perfect, right? Why would the human be better? This is just brute forcing it with some smart algorithms, going down the trees, different branches, trying different things, playing against itself, throwing hundreds of millions of random combinations at it and seeing which ones work, which ones don't. So we're at this age where we can brute force pretty much anything. And we can even make chatbots or attempt to do so. So this one went uh, haywire. This was Google. Uh, no, not Google. This was Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft said, um, let's put this prototype out there and learn from other humans. And humans are bad. We know this robot didn't know and just said, OK, training, 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 training. Now I know what humans say. I can say the same thing. So suddenly it became abused, basically, by humans and started spitting out bad, bad stuff. So they pulled it off and said, we'll do it again some months later. So the, the lesson is. Don't um, overfit on your training data too much. Keep some regularization. Um, make sure it doesn't um, do too well on memorizing stuff. Um, Microsoft did win, however, the ImageNet challenge. So they had a very deep neural net that was the best at seeing images. So Microsoft has a lot of good research, but this one went a little um, too early. So what will happen? As a summary, what will happen in the future? Well, people will move, or businesses, enterprises will move from simple models that are based on spreadsheets and rules, or maybe a logistic regression, which is a little better than a rule, but barely, right, where a single desktop workstation would be the, the, the instrument of choice, to a world where 
it's totally data driven. Many devices, IoT, uh, chips everywhere, cameras everywhere, sensors everywhere, feeds of, of behaviors, um, social media, what other things are going on in the world right now are influencing each other, what's going on in the stock market in Asia, and what's going on with this uh, local weather phenomenon that people might not go onto the streets anymore. Will my insurance rate drop because there's fewer people on the street and so on? Like you can imagine all kinds of scenarios. And to incorporate all of these, that's basically the new game. And it requires to have some math skills and of course some access to good data sources. So data is the new gold. The algorithms are more or less commodity. But putting it all together, that's also valuable. And that's what our company does. So we are basically bringing AI to the business, if you want to say it that way. Um, AI is not quite the right term here, but it sounds good. We're not really doing AI at the point where there's a Terminator coming to your door deciding what he's going to do, right? This is more like a, a, an instrument for you to make smarter decisions, build smarter apps, where you can deploy at scale certain models that are based on machine learning that will make certain decisions for you and will give you uh, reasons why they made those decisions, and then you'll be able to um, maybe predict the business or even know how to change your business such that it becomes better. So this is not just predictive analytics, but prescriptive analytics that the machine will tell you, hey, if you did this and this instead, you would have gotten this much in return. And today, many people are still in the descriptive analytics where they say, well, looking at yesterday's logs, we saw that 20% triggered this rule that caused this and this to happen. And we want to move them forward to the prediction and then the prescription part. All of this is open source. We have deep learning. We have gradient boosting, random forest, decision trees, logistic regression, fully regularized elastic net, lasso, um, rate regression, clustering, matrix factorization, principal components, you name it. We have uh, many smart statisticians. We have Stanford advisors, uh, Rob Tipsharani and Trevor Hasty and Stephen Boyd. Um, they come to our office regularly and we discuss for hours what should be the best approaches to be taken and so on. Um, it's all on GitHub, so you can check out the source code. You can download the, the jar file. It's a single jar file that you can just run with java-jar and it'll launch up an H2O instance on which you can then train machine learning models. And I'll show you a demo in a bit, in a bit but um, it's super easy. So nobody should feel like they cannot do this because my mom can literally do this. It's so easy. If you can run Excel, you can run this. Um, R, Python are the common interfaces for data scientists, but of course there's native Java, uh, Java and Scala integration, and there's also a GUI, a graphical interface, and connection to Spark and the Hadoop ecosystem, of course, is, is granted. And one thing is the Java scoring code. Uh, you'll see that later, but that's one uh, important thing to keep in mind. So this is our team. It's growing rapidly. We have 10 more additions in the last two weeks or so. My wife is somewhere in there as well. We actually both work at H2O, so we're, we're that thrilled to be there. And we also have two kids in the last two years, so. It's busy times for sure. We have um, really good people here. These are just uh, some people's uh, resumes that are popping out. So the author of Data Table for R, he works for us. The author of the Grammar of Graphics, Lee Wilkinson, that's the foundation for Tableau and for ggplot. He also works with us, or right next to me. Um, um, people that wrote books on the operating systems that worked at startups, that Reed Hastings founded, the guy who made Netflix and was at PayPal. All these guys are like valuable assets, right? And we are hiring, so if anybody here is looking for data science jobs or hardcore systems hackers, uh, please talk to me later or come to our booth. This is the architecture of H2O. Not to confuse you, but basically you can suck in any data from any, any store. Let's say it's a CSV format, right? Columnar data. Uh, we parse it, we distribute it across the cluster. Could be a 10 node cluster, could be a laptop, could be a 100 node cluster. Uh, we compress it, we have our data frame. We can then run um, MapReduce on it, which means you can compute summary statistics, you can, we can change the data. Any element you can change at any time. 
Um, you can build models. You can join data, whatever you want to do. But the modeling part is our strength, right? We have the best models to build, let's like, say, a gradient boosting model that predicts something. And then once you have a model, you can take that model and put it in production. And the same model that you built that was in this in-memory state that can be exported as a single file, a Java file, that then just directly gets embedded into your streaming system of your choice. It doesn't have to be either. It's just Java code. Anything that runs Java, you can run this in. And of course, security and all that stuff we have as well. So if you're an R person, you can type R code. And that will, this one liner here will literally build a deep learning model. That's how easy it is to build a deep learning model. In Python, you do something similar. You have to import some estimator, and then you say, make me one, and then call the dot train method, similar to this sklearn approach. Uh, in Scala, from a Spark environment, we also have PySpark, by the way. So you can write Python, or you can write Scala code directly. And then there's this Flow API that I'll show you a demo um, in just in a minute, where you have a graphical output. All this is just a way to talk to the cluster. When you run something from R, you're not actually doing anything in R. This is not scaling R to the Hadoop cluster. This is R is a remote control that sends a JSON string to the cluster and says, please run this. Please suck in this data from Hadoop. Please um, munge it. Please join those 10 billion rows. Um, please build a gradient boosting machine, build an ensemble, do cross-validation, whatever it is. It's always telling the back end what to do. And the model that comes out could look like this. This is a gradient boosting model. That's a Java code representation of that. It's just if else statements for your decision tree. And that's very fast because there's no heap allocation. There's no structure to jump around in. This is literally registers code executing if else. So if your number is bigger than this, go left, otherwise go right. And your number comes in in your streaming environment. So this is nanoseconds, latencies, small POJOs can be embedded anywhere. And the Spark story is such that we are living in the same JVMs as a Spark application. So we are, we are not having a separate cluster or anything. But if you want, we can also do that. We have a serialization to a different cluster. So you can have your own 10 node GPU cluster with H2O on it, let's say, and then your Spark cluster, and they could talk to each other. But the normal mode is this way, where they're sitting in the same JVM. The data can be copied from one to the other without extra copies. So when you say you have a data frame in Spark and you want to see it in H2O, then it gets just um, imported into H2O, right? But when you go the other way, H2O doesn't actually write it out. H2O just says here it looks like a Spark data frame now because it talks the same API. So it's a, it's a, it's a shallow copy if you want. And H2, of course, can modify the frame. So once we suck it into H2O, we are at our own liberty to modify it. And that's where the strength is. We can build algorithms that MLlib cannot build. And we can have more features, maybe. We can be faster because we don't do the redundancy. We don't do the fault tolerance. We're just there to be the fastest execution engine to build these models, the most accurate models with the most features, like 3D, 3D quantile regression, um, statistical things that are not as easy to implement, um, specific uh, cross-validation given a fold column, and all that kind of stuff. But data scientists love us because we have all these features. That's, that's all we did. So this is the demo. I'm going to show that to you live. Um, so this is a cluster here. I connected to it. There's some IP address and some port. This is actually VPN into our office. And I can show you that there's a water meter here that shows us the, the 10 nodes. So each of those 10 nodes has um, two 8-core Xeons, so 16 threads with hyper-threading that makes it 32 threads. So you see 10 times 32 threads here jumping up and down. Blue means it's idle. So this is currently used by maybe one of my colleagues right now for some testing. So sometimes you see something bounce up and down, but it's mostly idle, so we can run something. So we can load old flows that I made a while ago. But I don't really want to do that. I want to show you how easy it is to do it from scratch. So all I'm going to do here is I'm going to copy this path. And I'm going to reload this page to make a fresh page. This is how it starts when you, when you connect to the cluster. So this on your laptop looks exactly the same. When you say reload, um, 
This is using the public Wi-Fi. I hope it's fast enough. Okay. This is how your H2O instance looks. And all you have to do is java-jar h2o.jar and then enter. And then you connect to your browser and this is how it looks like. All you need for that is Java runtime. So I will say import files and then I specify the path. Say, yep, that's it, enter. I wanna add this to my selected list of files. I can add a whole folder or um, a whole hive directory or something, but by default, this is just easier for demos to show one file. Now it parses the first four megabytes or so and figured out that it's a CSV, comma separated, has headers, and we show you a preview. So now you can see, okay, this is a 12 column data set. These are the types, the, the names. And I'm gonna change maybe the year to an enum, maybe the month to an enum, because it's not really a number. More doesn't mean it's more. Like is November really more than October? Yeah, maybe, but then January is not less than December, right? So it's kind of a cyclical thing. Sometimes it's better to just keep them separate as separate months. So every January is different than every September or something, but it's not necessarily ordered, it's just different. So now I said that, the scheduled departure time, the scheduled arrival time, the carrier ID, um, the scheduled elapsed time, that's just a difference between the departure and arrival time, so it's redundant, but oh well, we leave it in there, the model should be able to handle it. The origin and destination are just codes, like SFO or whatever, and then there's a distance and there's a departure delay indicator that says yes or no, was this plane delayed? And now I'm gonna parse this, and as we're parsing it, we can probably see some activity on the cluster. All nodes are sucking in this data, Oh, it's already done. So in five seconds, we parse this file. Now we can look at it. This file has 116 million rows. Who remembers this file from earlier in the keynote? Okay, so this is the same file. 160 million rows. It's gotten compressed down to two gigs. It was actually six gigs on file, and that's because it's only a subset of the columns. I removed the ones that are uh, cheating, that already give away the outcome. For example, that. Uh, the cancellation was true or not, or the taxi delay was there or not. So I took away all the features that are not helping to make a fair model. Now what's left is just good features, scheduled times, and so on. Here you see the chunk summary that tells us the data got cut up into little pieces, one byte, two byte things, or bit things. No four byte, no eight byte stuff. No doubles, no floats. Um, only small stuff because it's all small numbers that can be compressed losslessly into our raw byte arrays that are D and N compressing it in real time. So the store itself is a byte array, but the numbers get um, turned with some bit shift arithmetic if you want into the actual double when you ask for it. And the data is distributed across the cluster. You see each machine has about 180 megs or so. So this is small data, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying this is big data, this is Hadoop scale. No, 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 this is just an example for a machine learning problem. For machine learning, this is actually not too small, but this is our toy data set I can run a demo in in like a minute, okay? So I'm gonna say build a model, but before I do that, I'm gonna split the data into like 90, 10. For those that do data science, you wanna be careful about not training on all your data because then you're left with nothing to test the model on. So I built um, two data sets here, 90% and 10%. I'm gonna click on the 90%. I'm gonna say I build a model. Well, which model do we wanna build? Deep learning or random forest or gradient boosting or generalized linear modeling or generalized low rank modeling or k-means or naive base or principal component analysis. Well, let's do a generalized linear model. That's for people who um, logistic regression Maybe they saw that in school or something. That's a simple method. And I can predict the departure delay. I will have a validation frame to compute the, the performance of the model on. I'm gonna say I want binomial uh, family, which is yes or no outcome. All the other features we don't need to touch. And I can just say go. Now this will run on the whole cluster again. Launching a MapReduce style computation on the data pump up and down, every time it pumps down, it communicates a little bit and then it uh, computes again. And once this is done, it has processed the 160 million rows, okay? And it has computed an exact solution of the regularized logistic regression. 
in 16 seconds. Now we can look at the model and it will tell us, okay, the performance, the, the objective function, the cost has decreased and we have a certain training metric. So first we can see the parameters that were used here for those that wanna be uh, making sure that they have an audit trail. You can see the training metrics, uh, ROC curves. If you don't know what this means, it's not too bad. Uh, ideally you wanna have a curve that's sharp, goes to the top left corner. Anything above the diagonal is a good model. Anything close to the diagonal is not so good. So you wanna get up as much as you can. The numbers that you get here are between 0.5 and one. The more towards one, the better your model. And this is on the validation metric. So we got a 65, which is not perfect, but it's good enough. But you can't expect to predict the airport uh, airline delay just from the airport, right? You have no weather data, you have no nothing. So this is, it's as good as it gets basically. But this says Eastern airline is never delayed, has a negative correlation with it because it didn't have a schedule. It was, as soon as the plane was full, the plane left. So it was never delayed by definition. Then Atlanta is always busy, Chicago is busy and so on. You, can, you get the idea. So this was a model that was built 15 seconds and was a GLM giving a 65 AUC. Now I'm gonna build a deep learning model. Um, same way, under 90%, apologize for the font size, a little small here because of the projector being such a good projector here. I'm doing the same thing. And then I will say here, I'll make it a deep neural net with the four layers deep. And all I'm gonna do is process it for one epoch, which is one pass over the data, okay? And we can also compute the variable importances to see what's going on. Now I say build model. And you see that the cell here gets auto-populated and you can save this. So I can save this flow here as like my, my demo and just save it. And now I can go to flows here on the right and I see it. So I can load this again tomorrow this stays on the cluster. So if I connect from some other computer, I can still see the same flow tomorrow. And this cell was auto-populated with the, the, the defaults if I didn't specify anything else, but you can just change something and re-execute the same cell. So it's like an IPython notebook if you want, or a Jupyter notebook, but it's slightly different because I never had to type anything, right? I just used the mouse for the whole workflow. And I can also have interactive graphs. For example, the, the um, the model that we got um, on the deep learning model right here, I can see it as it's being trained in real time. It's not done yet, it still says running, but I still can look at it. And I can get some of the first points here. How is it doing at 0 0.001, whatever, small number of epochs at the very beginning. It had like no good metrics. See, it's pretty crappy here, it's all flat. This is not a good model yet, but this was after maybe only 1% of the data. So let's reload because it's already done. It only took 50 seconds. Now I'm reloading it. And that's the beauty of, of H2O. You can reload this, this output cell and it will show you the current state of the model. Even if it trains for six hours, every second you can reload and see how is it going, how is it going. And if there's something wrong, you can just stop it. You don't have to wait until it's finished. Oh, look at this, 70 AOC. So we just beat significantly the GLM model earlier, the logistic regression model, and it only took a minute, right? Instead of 15 seconds, it took 55 seconds or something. So this deep learning, it doesn't take that long. This is CPUs, there's no GPUs. We're working on GPUs as well, but this was on CPUs on a cluster, and this is faster than GPUs because it's a small neural network. So there's some cases where it's actually much faster. You see this is a four layer neural network with 800 inputs, different airports and city codes and air carrier codes and so on. So this is how it works. This is as easy as it gets. And of course the output is also a Java file here. It says how to download, how to curl the Java file. And this is the thing that you can put into the production. This is the, the deep learning model with all the stuff in it. So fairly easy to use. And one of the important things is, is that you can try everything, right? Not just GLM, not just deep learning. You can run random forest. You can run gradient boosting. Gradient boosting is really important these days because it has so many tuning options that are powerful to generalize better. It's not overfitting as much as it used to be. Now you have stochastic elements that make it really powerful. So it's often deep learning and GBM win and Kaggle. And Kaggle is a data science competition. 
So again, how does it all work? Well, we're using this chunking of the data, as I showed you earlier. Each column is separate. Each, each, each row goes on a different machine, basically, or one machine only. Each row belongs to one server. It doesn't get replicated. It's just spread across. And now you can parallelize using MapReduce. And you can have as much memory as your cluster has. You can fill it all up with data, and you just process it. There literally is no faster way, because we're using uh, primitive uh, Java objects, not actual capital integer or capital double. No, we're only using lowercase byte arrays, right? Super raw primitives. And the behavior in the end, this is like a pandas data frame or a Spark data frame or an R data frame. You can mix and match columns. If you drop one, then you don't have to skip at every row when you process it because that, that column is just gone. You don't care about it. You only read the data that you actually have. So if you had six machines, you would spread the data across six machines. Everybody gets one sixth. It's all straightforward. Now you have one sixth on each machine. Each has these little chunks. You can process it in a MapReduce paradigm. This is not Hadoop's MapReduce. This is our own MapReduce. We also use our own fork join framework, our own, our own network layer, our own uh, serialization layer, our own memory manager, and so on. So this is hardcore Java basically written by Cliff Click, the co-founder who, who wrote the just-in-time compiler for Java, right? So when you put this together, you get all these reduces and maps that work together, and every time they reduce, you have to say what they're doing. The state gets combined, and you get one final state, and so on. In the end, you have one result that is the final model, and that gets put into the distributed key value store. And then you can ask it on a REST layer on the web interface, hey, what does it look like? And then you do another pass, and you update it again, and then you say, hey, what does it look like, and so on. So it's an iterative process that gets pushed into this distributed store, and you can ask any node at any time, what does the model look like? So I mentioned that it's distributed, that it's compressed, it's low-level code. You can change the data, because if you change any field in the whole matrix, it just re-changes this little compressed chunk. If it's the same type of chunk, it doesn't even have to recompress it. It just changes the raw byte somewhere. But if it has to, then it will blow that little chunk up, change the numbers, and then compress it freshly into a different type. So it's a pretty smart approach to modifying your data. And for example, for tree building, we also have one of the first, if not the only first, uh, open source distributed gradient boosting machine. So gradient boosting is a serial algorithm. Right? Each tree fixes what's wrong with all the previous trees. You cannot build them in parallel like a random forest. There you just build 1,000 trees, then you sum them up. No, this one is different. Each tree has to wait until all the others before it are done, and then you build the next one. So now what we can do is we can make the, each tree building itself parallel. So how do you do this? You, you have to somehow find the right split point where to split, right? The tree is saying, if age less than 17, go left, otherwise go right. And this split decision has to be made in parallel. So everybody sends their data um, about the split finding process to one guy. But they don't actually send the data itself. The data stays distributed. All they do is they figure out where to split. And they say, I would split here. And the other guy says, well, I would split here, basically. But it's not quite like that. It's, it's basically histograms. And you can build histograms in parallel by adding them up and then averaging them in the end. That's the same as building the histogram on all the data. So this is a, a way to use some math principles because summing up A plus B is the same as A plus B. Right? It doesn't matter where A and B are. So that's, that's what we're doing. And it turns out that if you make this histogram good enough, it actually works really well. And it works really well for many customers across many industries. Um, over 7,000 enterprises are using H2O. And these are not even all of the companies. I hope that all these logos are approved. Otherwise, sorry. Um, so this is a select list. And you can see here, Progressive was on stage earlier today, the keynote talking about um, their use cases. And actually, there's a whole video explaining the details about that. There's user-based insurance. Then this is market share, where they have um, lots of marketing campaigns, and they figure out what to optimize, like who to target, right? And they build many, many models for each of those clients that need that campaign optimization. This is Nielsen Catalina. So when you watch TV, and then you go to a safe and buy something, they match those two and say, OK, because you saw the 
Coors Light commercial and you bought Coors, I think that mattered, right? So they can optimize the advertising. Insurance, again, Zurich Insurance using us to make better decisions. And Capital One, you also heard today at the keynote, um, Adam was shouting out to us that uh, it helped that it could detect another fraud case or uh, some cybersecurity issue that um, they found thanks to their machine learning models in place. So there's a lot of good use cases and they're just starting to learn what's even possible, right? And this is for the data scientist among you. If, if you're interested, these booklets are at our booth. You can pick some up and if not, then there's more tomorrow. These are for all these different applications and we also have online tutorials. So this is one that I wrote a few weeks ago. It's a GBM tuning guide, gradient boosting method, how to tune the models using hyperparameter search and so on, early stopping to avoid overfitting, all that stuff you can automate. This is basically, the only thing you have to do is put in your data set at the beginning and then let the whole thing run, that's it. This will find a really good model for you. You don't need to do anything other than just replace this Titanic data set with your data set. And maybe use a Tenno cluster instead of your laptop. So there was a KD Nuggets poll recently that uh, looked at all the deep learning tools and H2O is one of the easy to use ones as you saw earlier and that's why we're, we're, we're up there tied with TensorFlow. TensorFlow is new and it's hyped but maybe not all the things are perfect about it but it's really good enough that we wanna integrate with it, right? So H2O and TensorFlow together most likely it will be better than one alone. So the goal is to um, put all this stuff together. And there's a demo already, we have one, and there's a YouTube video also that I made that um, explains what's going on. This is like a 20 minute long YouTube video explaining the integration of TensorFlow with H2O and Spark and Python and all that. And you can actually run a TensorFlow model and take the weights out of it, put it into deep learning in H2O and then get your POJO model that you could put in production as a Java model, right? Or you can continue training that in H2O, or you can go back to TensorFlow, or you can take the weights in Spark. I mean, all of this is in Spark, it's in Python, it's in Java, it's, once it's in, in H2O, you can also get it from R again, right? Because it's connected to the backend. So everything is everywhere. So this is really cool. These software tools are really able to make a lot of difference to you. And our future is geared towards more user experience, right? You all understand data science alone is not gonna change the world. You have to bring it to the business. So algorithms and data, we figured that out. Now we're going to the experience part. So Lee Wilkinson, the guy who wrote the grammar of graphics and Tony Shu, they're leading this, this, this effort. Seven people are so working full time on visualization and design and um, pretty interfaces to make these data applications, these data products that people can put uh, their vertical applications into something well-rounded that can be used by other people, not just by some geek. And Steam is the, the next-gen product that we're building on that's combining the, these different personas, right? You're not just an engineer that wants to put a model in production. You're not just a data scientist. There's not just uh, DevOps people that worry about the cluster performance, the Hadoop clusters and so on. You wanna have all of them combined in one effort and Steam will help with that. So the data scientists can deploy clusters on their own if the IT guys set it up properly and then they, can, they don't have to worry about asking IT every time when they wanna launch a cluster. And also the data scientists themselves get help from us by automatically building the right models. So if you come to our booth, we can tell you more about the demos. There's live uh, screens and so on, but we also have an event in New York uh, next month and then one in uh, Texas in October where we'll have hundreds of people and businesses, enterprises talk about the use cases and so on. And definitely don't forget to download it. It is free and open source. Only if you're a really big company, we want you to pay, okay? <laughs> so it's all fine. Um, there's online support. Um, we have really good feedback from the community and we'd love to hear more from you. So thank you very much.